Uh, today we're sharing together an instructed Eucharist. Uh, today is the feast of the most precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, commonly called Corpus Christi. So throughout the service, there'll be a running commentary to help us explore together the purpose of our gathering and the how and the why of what we do when we get together. The service we're sharing this morning is known as communion, for in it we commune with God and also with each other as the body of Christ. It's also known as the Eucharist, which is the Greek word for thanksgiving. In the Eucharist, we give thanks for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Some Anglicans refer to the service of communion as the Lord's Supper or the Mass. Whatever name we use, the Eucharist is like a drama, a drama that we all enter. And the drama consists of three acts, the gathering of the community, the proclamation of the word, and the celebration of the Eucharist. Now the liturgy isn't something that the clergy do while the congregation watches. This can be seen when we look at the word liturgy itself. Liturgy is a Greek word that means the work of the people. So our liturgy, our worship, is the work of us all, something we all do together. It is also something of a workout, as we are in constant motion. Generally speaking, we stand for praise, we sit for instruction, and we kneel for prayer. You will notice that many Anglicans will acknowledge the altar and the cross by bowing. Some may genuflect. At certain times in the service, many will make the sign of the cross. The comedian Robin Williams, who was an Episcopalian, once described all this movement as pew aerobics. So, in our liturgy, we should get a workout. As well as being active, Anglican worship is meant to engage the whole person and involves all the senses. Our eyes are greeted by the hangings and vestments that grace our lectern and altar and the other images and ornaments that adorn the church. The hangings change color according to the seasons of the church year and the particular feast that is being celebrated. These aids to worship constitute icons or windows to God and reflect the Anglican desire to praise God in the beauty of holiness. The music of the organ and the singing of hymns, the words offered in our prayers and the instruction offered in the homily engages our sense of hearing. The flowers on the altar, the scent of candles, and sometimes incense, which symbolizes our prayers rising to heaven, engages our sense of smell. The exchange of the peace and the elements of bread and wine pressed into our palms engage our sense of touch. We engage our sense of taste as we partake of the consecrated bread and wine. So just as we offer our whole selves to God, our worship is deliberately designed to be a total body experience. Now the moving of our hearts to offer praise and song to God is part of our very core as human beings. And so we begin our worship with praise as we sing our processional hymn. Note that the procession is led by the cross, a reminder that we are all called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. So please stand as we sing our processional hymn, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness.
We now have the greeting. The greeting is taken from 2 Corinthians 13, 13. Many people cross themselves at the beginning of the opening acclamation. The sign of the cross dates back to at least the year 200, when Christians marked themselves with the cross on the forehead. But by the following century, the gesture had become the bigger one we use today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The greeting is followed by the prayer known as the Collect for Purity. This Collect was an English rendering by Archbishop Thomas Cramner of the Latin prayer that started the Sarum Liturgy, which was used by medieval churches in England before the Reformation. For centuries, the Collect for Purity was said silently by the priest, but the prayer book of 1552 made this prayer a public one, said aloud by the priest for all the people gathered. At St. Paul's, we say it together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The service continues now in every season of the year but Advent and Lent with the glory to God, or Gloria, a Greek song of praise. By the fourth century, it formed part of the morning prayers and attained its present place in the Holy Eucharist by the early Middle Ages. This song centers centers the service on God, the God we're gathered to praise in our worship. Out of respect, some people slightly bow their head whenever the name of Jesus is mentioned. This echoes the words of St. Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi. Many people cross themselves at the mention of the Trinity at the end of the Gloria. is followed by another ancient hymn of the church, the Kyrie Eleison, Greek for Lord have mercy. Its emphasis is not on us, not on our sinfulness, but on God's mercy and the salvific action in Jesus Christ. Kyrie is followed by the Collect. The Collect is written to go along with both the season of the church year and the readings of the day. It helps to collect us together by summarizing the attributes of God as revealed in the scripture for the day. And so we say the Collect together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that in this wonderful sacrament You have given us the memorial of your passion. Grant us so to reverence the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may know within ourselves and show forth in our lives the fruits of your redemption. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And I'd invite the children to come forward. I need some help this morning. So the more the better. Now, I forgot to do something. Can you forget what I forgot to do? Do I normally look like this in church? No, I forgot to get dressed. I'm feeling half naked here. So you're gonna help me get dressed this morning. Now, the first thing you'll notice is what color am I wearing? Black. Why do you think priests wear black? Any ideas? What does black, the color black, remind you of? Any ideas? Well, it's the color of death. That's pretty grim, pretty bleak. That the priests wear black. Well, it reminds the priest that they are, when they become priests, they die to themselves and they die to the world. Their first concern is no longer about themselves, about their own comfort and pleasure. It's no longer about getting ahead in the world. Priests die to themselves, they die to the world so that they can serve God and so that they can serve the people of God. Now, priests also wear something else around their neck, a collar. So I'm going to put on my collar. Who else wears collars? Not you? <laughs> you know anybody who wore collars or who wears collars? Do any of you have pets? A dog wears a collar. Why does a dog wear a collar? So it can't get away, so you can control it. Uh, also, it often has a dog tag on it saying who it belongs to, right? Uh, in the ancient world, slaves wore collars. And so priests wear collars to remind them that they are servants of Christ, that Christ is their master, right? So that's why they wear collars. Now, Priests wear a long white gown over here. Can, can a couple of you want to go get it for me? Right there. Okay. I can't do this alone. No? I'm going to have to dress myself? Well, this is called an alb or a cassock alb. And it covers me up all the way from Adam's apple, from here, all the way down to my ankles. Why do you think I cover myself all the way from my Adam's apple, all the way down to my ankles? Hmm? Well, why did you guys come here this morning? <laughs> did you come to worship Norman, Father Norman? No. You came to worship God, right? So in covering myself up, it's a reminder that you're not here because I'm here. You're not here to hear me, right? I'm not the important thing. Jesus, God is the important thing, right? And this, I am cloaked in this gown to remember that it's just a uniform, that what's important is the role that I play, not who I am, okay? And what color is it? White. And why do you think it's white? What does white remind you of? Munsters? Oh dear. <laughs> I hope not. Well, you were all baptized, right? And when you were baptized, you were washed clean, right? And made new, right? And white reminds me that I'm baptized, that I've been washed clean by Jesus. Uh, it's the color of 
righteousness, how in my life I'm supposed to do the right things. And then I have a rope called a cincture. And you tie the rope around my waist and you tighten it and you tie it off. What do you think this cincture, this rope, is symbolic of? Other than keeping my pants up. (laughs) Hopefully. Hmm? Well, it remembers that I am tied, that I am bound to the gospel to preach the good news of Jesus. Not just in my words, but in my acts, by how I live my life. And then, I put on a cross. What does the cross represent? You know? Jesus. It represents how Jesus loved us so much that he took up the cross and died on the cross for us. And when I put on the cross, it's a reminder that how, as followers of Jesus, we're all called to take up our cross and follow Jesus out of love, just as Jesus loved us. And then I put on a scarf called a stole. And what shape is that? If I held it upside down, what would it look like? Does that remind you of a shape or a letter? It looks like a U, exactly. It also looks like a yoke that holds oxen together, right? And the stool reminds me how I'm yoked to Jesus, how I'm bound to Jesus, how I'm bound to the gospel. And you'll see there's a cross in the middle. And before I put it on, I kiss the cross as a sign of how remembering how much Jesus loved me and how much I love Jesus and how much I love being a servant of Jesus in putting on this yoke. And what color is it? Beige? Well, yellow? White? Gold. Gold. And that's because today is a feast day. White or gold is the color of joy or celebration. Right? And then I put on, it looks like a cape or a poncho, and it's called a chasuble, and it's all made of one piece of fabric, just like the robe that Jesus wore on the cross was made of a single piece of fabric. And so when I put on the chasuble, it reminds me how I am cloaked in Jesus. And what's on the front of my chasuble? A phoenix. And what are phoenixes symbolic of? Yeah. Any ideas? Any of you read Harry Potter? No? (laughs) The order of the phoenix? Well, the phoenix is a bird that never dies, that resurrects itself from the ashes. So it represents eternal life, the eternal life of Jesus, the eternal life of God. It's a symbol of the resurrection, okay? So I'm feeling a lot better now that I'm dressed properly. And uh, shall we say a prayer together before we go to Sunday school? Do you want to stand and hold hands? You'll hold my hand, thank you. (laughs) Gracious God, We give you thanks for these children. May they be clothed in righteousness so that they may grow up to love and serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for helping me get dressed this morning.
And is there Sunday school this morning? Okay, so you can go off to Sunday school. I say to you, <clears throat> reading and commenting on scripture goes back to the earliest services of Christianity. Following the pattern of Jewish synagogue worship, readings follow a set pattern for what will be read when, after I finish this. This is known as a lectionary. The Christian communities began to add letters of Paul and others to their service. It was these readings that became in time our New Testament, our usual pattern at our Sunday services is read a portion of the book in the Old Testament, a psalm, a portion of the New Testament, epistle or letter, and a portion of a gospel. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we follow the revised common lectionary, which is used by 45 church bodies worldwide. The translation of the Bible we usually use at St. Paul's is the 1989 New Revised Standard Version. The new Revised Standard Version has received the widest official authorization by the churches of any translation of the Bible with endorsement for public use by the Anglican Communion. Most mainline Protestant churches and the American and Canadian conferences of Catholic bishops. So now we have our first reading. Our first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger then by feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow from you from flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We begin our readings with a portion of a psalm. Since 1,000 years before Christianity, the psalms have been included as part of the corporate worship of God's people. Because of their breadth and depth of expression about our relationship with God, they are rightly called the church's songbook and prayer book. So now we'll have the reading of the psalm. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise, Praise the Lord, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with lines of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. He declares his word to Jacob. His statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt just with any other nation creation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. 
God of the universe, Lord of life, give us grace to see you in all our works, in all creatures, all people, and in our hearts, that we may faithfully serve you and worthy praise you only. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we have the second reading, the epistle reading. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading of the Gospel is the last of the scripture readings and the climax of the series. Several actions are taken to show the particular importance we place on Jesus' words and actions. The Gospel book is carried in procession to the place of reading. The Gospel traditionally was read from a pulpit or ambo. Hence the term gradual for the hymn before the gospel, from the Latin gradus, meaning step. It is now often read in the middle of the congregation, a fitting way to hear the story of the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Other actions and posture also mark out the importance of the gospel. The congregation stands for the reading of the gospel. Before and after the gospel reading, the, proclaim, the people acclaim Christ present in the sacred word. Some also make the sign of the cross with their thumb on their forehead, lips and breasts to express their prayer that the good news be in their mind, or their lips, and in their heart. The gospel is traditionally read by a deacon. The ordination service for a deacon states their duties to serve all people, especially those who are poor, weak, sick, or lonely, in the name of Jesus Christ to make Christ known in the world by word and example, to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world. In addition to reading the gospel, deacons prepare the altar for the celebration of the Eucharist. Now we have the hymn before the gospel.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of Christ. You'll be happy there's no homily this morning. Uh, the running commentary is taking the place of the home. <laughs> I have to live with him often. <clears throat> Having someone comment on the scriptures read goes back to the earliest days of Christianity and to the Jewish synagogue worship which preceded it. Preaching was rare during the Middle Ages but was put back into a place of honor in the reformation of the church in the 1500s. Since 1549 a homely or sermon has been required at every Eucharistic service. What's the difference between a homily and a sermon? A homily is based on the lectionary readings of the day and attempts to connect the world of the text of Holy Scripture and the 21st century world in which we live so that we may hear and put into practice what God is speaking to us today. Sermons are not necessarily based on the readings of the day. A sermon provides religious instruction on a particular theme, teaching, or practice. Today's sermon is the commentary that runs through this instructed Eucharist. I suggest you listen a bit carefully because the sermon is given by not me. <laughs> no. 
nice try. <laughs> In response to the read and explain word of God, <laughs> we now affirm our faith together. At St. Paul's, we usually do this by saying the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. The word creed comes from the Latin credo for I believe. Both creeds have a Trinitarian framework. The Apostles' Creed goes back to the first half of the second century in Rome and is simpler in form. Its primary use was in connection with baptism. In the ninth century, it was added to the oral services. From these, it passed into morning and evening prayer and the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. The Nicene Creed is an expansion of the Creed issued in 325 by the Council of Nicaea, which had its own roots in the baptismal Creed of Jerusalem. Its use in the Eucharistic worship appears to have begun in Antioch in the 5th century and gradually spread through East and West until it was incorporated into the Western Eucharistic liturgy in 1014. You may notice that some people bow at the words, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. Bowing at this point is an expression of humble thanksgiving for awesome gift of Christ's incarnation. Many people cross themselves at the mention of resurrection and eternal life at the end of the creed. Making the sign of the cross at this time constitutes a personal affirmation or assent to what has just been said in the creed. So now we stand for the creed. Let us confess our faith as we say. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, we pray for ourselves and particularly on behalf of others. The prayers of the people are a response to the world proclaimed, growing out of the context of the community and the content of the proclamation as they prepare the people for the active response of the Christian life. The Book of Alternative Services offers many different forms for these prayers, but all usually lift up our thanksgivings and petitions for the church. 
the king and all in authority, the world, the local community, those in need and the departed. As St. Paul's, we also often use our prayers reflecting the theme of the day or the current situation in the world, as is the case in today's service, fittingly as they are of all people. These prayers are led by members of the congregation. So now we have the prayers of the people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, please listen to our prayers of your people gathered at your table. In faith we pray. We, we pray, pray to you, you, our God. God. Here, where we celebrate how Christ gave, up, gave us his body to be our spiritual food, please listen as we pray for his body the church spread throughout the world. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Here, where we recognize the presence of Christ, who takes away the sin of the world, please listen as we pray for that world and for its peoples for whom his blood was shed. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Here, where we come together as Christ gathered with his friends to give us this meal of holy fellowship, please listen as we pray for all whom you have given us, our friends, and all those and all whose lives are joined with ours. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Here, where we remember the night of Christ's agony and trial. Please listen as we pray for all who share his sufferings through fear or pain or distress of many kinds. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Here, where we join our praises with the whole company of heaven, Please listen as we pray for all who have trusted Christ's promise to raise up on the last day those who eat his flesh and drink his blood. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Lord, please satisfy our hunger with the food that lasts, the bread of God which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The prayers of the people are followed by the confession of sin. We ask God's forgiveness for those things done and for those things left undone, and for the strength to live as we were created to do. Private confession to a priest or the Sacrament of Reconciliation, is also offered at St. Paul's. The Anglican view of private confession is that all may, none must, some should. Private confession can be particularly helpful for those who desire to unburden themselves of past wrongs and set out on, a new, set out on new trajectories in their lives. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The priest, in giving absolution, assures us that all who make sincere, a sincere confession are forgiven by God. Traditionally, people kneel, or if standing, they bow, during the words of the confession and the absolution. This declaration is called an, abs this declaration is called an absolution, and it is one of the ways that ordained priests and bishops fulfill the commission that Jesus give, give, gave to his disciples when he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Often people will cross themselves as the priest pronounces the words of absolution. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When we receive God's forgiveness, we're set free to share God's precious gift of peace with one another. The peace is not an intermission. It is an act that gives expression to the truth that we are all part of God's family and that God calls us to love one another. In its location in our liturgy, the peace gives us the opportunity to put into practice our Lord's words in Matthew 5, 20, verses 23 to 24. When you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. In the early centuries, Christians would greet each other with the kiss of peace. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace. Now we come to the second act in the drama with the celebration of the Eucharist. This second act begins with the offertory. Here we pause to offer to the Lord our time, talents, and treasure, remembering that the gifts we've been given are gifts to be shared. We give thanks for the gifts of bread and wine, which represent the bounty of God's creation and our own work in the world. It's customary for those officiating at the Eucharist uh, as they, after they prepare the altar to ceremonially wash their hands, an act called the lavabo. This is from the Latin translation of Psalm 26, verse 6. This symbolizes a prayer for purity as the officiants prepare to preside at the Holy Sacrament. Our offertory hymn, One Bread, One Body.
Let us say together the prayer over the gifts. God, our sustainer, receive the gifts we bring before you and feed us continually with the bread which satisfies all hunger. Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our offering is the first of four actions in the Eucharist. Just as scripture tells us that Jesus took, blessed, broke, and gave the bread and wine, so this first of our four actions is for the priest to take the bread and wine. When we gather together, we remember the most wonderful gift of all, Jesus, our Lord. Through repeating the words and actions of Jesus' last meal with his disciples, we ourselves join the story and make it our own. We don't just watch the drama or listen to it unfold, but we enter into the story as we take the bread and the wine and as we eat and drink. The elements of communion become the outward signs of inward grace. That grace or gift of God is Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anglicans have never felt the need to explain how Christ is present in the bread and the wine, but simply accept that presence as a holy mystery. The first part of the Eucharistic prayer is called the Sursum Corda, from the Latin words for lift up your hearts. It is an ancient part of the liturgy, and these words have been used in the Eucharistic liturgy since the very early centuries of the church. It is a remnant of an early Jewish call to worship. The proper preface often mentions the themes of the day or the church season. The sanctus, so-called because of the Latin word for holy, is also an ancient part of the liturgy since the earliest centuries. The first part comes from Isaiah's vision of heaven in Isaiah 6, chapter 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. The second part comes from the Gospel's description of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Many people cross themselves at the second part of the Sanctus. The words, this is my body and this is my blood, are called the words of institution. The prayer invoking the Holy Spirit to consecrate the gifts is called the epiclesis. The great amen is the people's ratification of the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator in heaven and earth. Today you have gathered us together in this Eucharistic feast that we may be renewed in love, joy, and peace. Now with all creation, we lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days he sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, 
and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, We remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming of glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The Lord's Prayer now follows in contemporary language. It's called the Lord's Prayer because Jesus gave it to us as a guide for all our prayers. So as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. tradition of the church, the officiant at the Eucharist waits to break the bread until after the Lord's Prayer. The breaking of the bread is a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ's body and blood on the cross. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The ancient hymn, Agnes Dei, or Lamb of God, was introduced into the Western Rite by Pope Sergius, the first in the seventh century. It is based on John 1, verse 29, in which John the Baptist, upon seeing Jesus, proclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. invitation used today is a modern rendition of the ancient church's invitation to communion, holy things for the holy, which was used in the Eastern church from at least the fourth century. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. The 
body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. It's common for Anglicans to cross themselves before receiving each element. Of course, we're still living in the wake of the pandemic. So rather than receiving uh, the host and the chalice separately, uh, we administer communion uh, by consecrated hosts that have been infused with three drops of wine. Uh, if you require a gluten-free host, uh, they're available, I have them here, so just let me know.
shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign towns, and all will understand. You shall see the face of God and live.
partake in the Eucharist and are spiritually nourished, but it's not for our benefit alone. Communion enables us to return to the world with renewed vigor for proclaiming the gospel in our words and in our lives. After communion, we rise and give thanks that we have been fed and nourished by Christ's body and blood to sustain us to live in the world as the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Let us pray together the prayer after communion. God of peace, you have nourished us in this sacrament with the body and blood of Christ. May we who have taken holy things keep faith in our hearts and lives in the names of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Glory to God with power worthy in us and do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Following the doxology, the priest pronounces God's blessing upon the people. This traditional blessing is based on the words that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard you your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is customary to respond to the blessing by making the sign of the cross as a symbolic expression of reception of the blessing and willingness to carry the cross as Jesus' disciple out into the world as you leave this morning. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs> the announcements go back to the 1950s when someone said, you know, this service just wasn't long enough. <laughs> Actually, they probably do go all the way back. <clears throat> they probably go back all the way back to the beginning of the Christian worship. Certainly, the last chapters of some of the Paul's epistles, which were meant to be read to the entire congregation, read lot to them. They are an important part of our time together, helping us stay connected and grow in our common life as members of the body of Christ, as in Paul's. You have to wait for announcements now, so say your prayers while you are given. Well, again, a very warm welcome to everyone here this morning, especially those who are visiting either in person or online. It's a blessing to have you with us. Uh, if you'd like to make St. Paul's your parish home, uh, there are cards in the pew racks in front of you. Uh, just fill one of those out and give them to uh, Cyril or myself or one of the uh, greeters. And please join us uh, for coffee this morning. Uh, repair on the north entrance will begin uh, tomorrow, so we ask that everyone use the south door during construction. Uh, work will be done in the, on the entrance on the other side of the doors where the food bank, normally, food bank boxes normally, normally is, and in the main office. Uh, so use the south doors rather than the usual north doors. Uh, the men's breakfast has been moved to Saturday, June 24th, to accommodate the yard sale, uh, which is taking place next Saturday, and also our community barbecue. Um, uh, if you have things to donate for the yard sale, uh, contact the parish office or Steve. Uh, people, if you, if you have a truck or a van and can help pick up things, uh, that would be most appreciated and take the leftover treasures to Value Village or Goodwill. Hopefully there won't be many of those. Uh, and please do invite your friends and neighbors to come to the community barbecue, which is also being held, along with the garage sale. 
Uh, and if you'd like to help set up, grill, clean up, or have a table that can be used, uh, please contact Cease, Ingrid, or the parish office. Uh, thank you to everyone who completed the Pioneers of Paul, the POP survey, and the feedback will help guide the planning for next year. Uh, there will be a year-end get-together on June 29th, which is a Thursday, between 5.30 and 7.30 at Lake Chaparral. Uh, there'll be a pizza dinner, dessert, and time to hang out and enjoy the lake and park facilities. And uh, interested youth, please uh, RSVP. Uh, a reminder that uh, we try to be a scent-free parish out of love and respect for those whose health is threatened by fragrances. Uh, so we'd ask your cooperation in avoiding wearing to church uh, perfume or aftershave or perfumed hairsprays and such. Uh, many thanks for those, for those of you who have been helping us keep a scent -free, us a scent-free parish, uh, except on those Sundays when we use incense. <laughs> those are holy scents, so they don't count. Um, we always end our service the way we began, by singing God's praise, and we are led out into the world by the cross, uh, reminding us of our need to follow the cross and to take up our cross as we leave the church and into our daily lives throughout the week. So our recessional hymn is Alleluia. Sing to Jesus.
as the celebration ends, you are charged to go forth into the world, usually by a deacon. The Eucharist is therefore not an exclusive gathering that separates us from the world, but a challenge to reach out beyond our own church to the world around us. Having been strengthened through the Eucharist, we are sent forth to carry Jesus' love with us into our homes, schools, and places of work. The Eucharist over, now the service begins. So I say to all of you, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thanks.